I'm going to share this morning on the transforming power of grace. Can I just submit to you this morning that if it wasn't for the grace of God, you wouldn't be in this room this morning. Because no one's that good. We depend on the grace of God. For by grace are we saved that not of ourselves. I just have a very simple word to share. It's called grace. I, 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 I don't have any deep theological new teaching to share with you. I just, I'm just here to talk about grace. I'm here to remind you what grace does. How grace, God's amazing grace. <laughs> I was lost. I was blind, but now I see. I'm going to read a lengthy passage of Scripture all the way down to verse 22. Beginning to verse number 1 in the NIV translation, it says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And he went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Just to kind of uh, remind you, in, in the previous couple of chapters, the persecution that took place, chapter 8, it says that they were scattered. When Stephen was killed, martyred, Saul here was welcoming it. He was holding the garments of those that were doing the stoning. Most likely Saul was in charge in that moment, or had been. And persecution on that brand new church who now, as you'll see here, people characterized it with a name. They called it The Way. Wow, isn't that cool? And so the Bible says they were scattered, but everywhere they were scattered, and they were scattered because of persecution, and everywhere they were scattered, the Word says they preached the gospel. Isn't that awesome? So Damascus... It's well over 100 miles from Jerusalem. To kind of give you an idea, I think I read 140, something like that. It's a, it's a strong, it's a long way. They were scattered a long way, but they were still a threat to the religious crowd. And Satan didn't like it. So look with me here. Verse number three. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And notice how Saul responded, Who are you, Lord? And Saul, Saul asked, he said, God said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Now you notice there was no argument here and no uh, displeasure on Saul's part to say, I'm not doing it. I mean, when you are stopped by the blinding light of Jesus Christ, you have no choice but say, yes, Lord. And the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. Now, this is, this, this is cool. They heard the sound, but they couldn't see what was going on. So they heard the Lord speak, but they didn't see anyone. And Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. And so they led him by the hand into Damascus. And for three days he was blind, did not eat or drink anything. Now in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. Say it with me, Ananias. And the Lord called him in a vision. He said, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. And this was a believer, a disciple. This was not a Saul that was not a disciple. This was a disciple in Damascus. And so he said, yes, Lord. And the Lord, verse 11, the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. Aren't you glad God knows our address and knows where we're at and everything of our life? He said, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. That is so awesome. He went from killing to praying. Oh, come on now. Think about it. I want you to think about the worst despot in this world and God saves them. Isn't that awesome? 
So verse 12, in a vision, Saul has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. God had it all working. Verse 13, Lord, Ananias answered. <laughs> now this is where flesh begins to come in. I've heard many reports about this man. Now, I want you to notice whose flesh starts rearing up. It wasn't the unsaved. It was the saved. Did y'all see that? The saved said, who are you, Lord? Lord said, go to, go to Damascus. He didn't say, I don't know you. He's, he said, yes, sir. But the believer said, no, no, wait a minute, Lord. God, wait a minute. I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. Wouldn't it be okay if he just stayed about five weeks blind? No, he didn't say that. God, wouldn't it be okay? Let it, let it just die. No, he didn't say that. But he said, I heard what he's done. And he's come here with authority. Now, here's the believer reminding Jesus what he's done. Now, the Lord has already worked a plan when both of them had visions of one or the other. And here is he saying, now, let me remind you, Lord, what he came here to do. I mean, he can say, boy, I don't need you. But he didn't. He said, he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. And the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And Ananias, then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul. Well, I got to say it. How long does it get us to the part of then? How long will we argue with God? Then Ananias went to the house. And he said, after he laid hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, Did y'all catch that? He's just reminding him now, you're part of the household of God, Brother Saul. You know, there's something powerful there. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Everybody say it immediately. Something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. And Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Three more verses. And at once, at once, not three weeks or three months later, at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. <laughs> that is so awesome. And all those who heard him were astonished and asked, Hey, isn't he? The man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name. And you can just hear their voices. And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priest? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Wow. What one of the most incredible salvation experiences that your word, that the God's word delivers to us. God, I want to thank you because the same Saul to Paul experience is happening every day. God, let us see that in our lives. Use us to be your agents of grace. God, you're calling Ananias to step out. And you're calling Saul's and turning them into Paul's into this out of this world. I thank you. I ask your anointing, speak this word through me today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Thank you, Susan. This passage is, is absolutely powerful. Just, I mean, I honestly... It doesn't need my interpretation of it. You can read it just plain out, and we could have an altar call. <laughs> this is cool. This is grace. This is the embodiment of the grace of God. Uh, and so I, I, I got to get my first, just go, go right into it. We've been talking about the book of Acts, 
and uh, the uh, transforming power of God and the gospel of God. And we've been talking about the normal Christian life. And here in the book of Acts chapter 9, we've seen what happened in 8 and the persecution of the church and the spreading uh, of not, I don't believe running in fear, but running with, with uh, 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 power and the anointing of God. And everywhere they went, God says, they preached the word. Well, here in Damascus was no less. And Paul had heard, Saul had heard about it. But what he didn't know was there is power in the grace of God. I just got to take a poll real quick. How many by lifting your hand says, I know all about the grace of God. It's changed me. How many understand without God's grace, there's no life. There's no salvation. There's no presence. Now, it, it's interesting that here in verse, verse 1, it says Saul was still breathing out. Notice with me again, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats. He was a madman. Now, I want you to just, just kind of a side note here. I want you to be reminded of something, that Saul was in earshot of what was going on before Stephen was killed, Stephen the first martyr. Go, ahead and go back to chapter, uh, what, 7 and 8. And he heard the voice of God through uh, the, or the word of God through the mouth of Stephen. And of course, the, all the Jewish religious buddies, all of them got together, they in the Sanhedrin, they were there to destroy. Well, I mean, just judging, just right there and destroy him. And he was, and he ultimately he was stoned. But even Stephen said, God, don't remember this against them. Whether someone responds today or that day, some 2,000 years ago, or if you respond today, or whether you respond to this word a year from now, God's word never comes back void. I don't know the exact time that was between Saul hearing the word of what Stephen said. He gave a litany of the gospel of God from Genesis to Revelation and the power of God and what God had done and that, that God is uh, uh, not a man that we can contain in this world. God is the power of God. He's not an idol. He's, and it was just, just a, a whole chapter of, of the preaching of, 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 of Stephen. And Saul was listening. And you know, when you're far away from God, when you hear the voice of God and what God wants to do, sometimes it causes just anger. And the Bible says they begin to gnash their teeth on him, on Stephen. And Saul was there and they killed him. And Saul was consenting. He was watching over, holding the garments of those that were stoning. And they all were scattered. In chapter 8, we, we, we got into, and, and then, of course, Philip with an evangelist and also a deacon, what he did. God used him with the touching the Ethiopian eunuch and him coming to know Jesus Christ. And now here in chapter 9, days, weeks, months, years after what he heard. God had not forgotten. Let me tell you, when God speaks something, God's going to honor what he says. And I believe what the word says, God's word will not come back void. God's word is so powerful that it, that it, it is, yes, original, and it is, there's a power inside. When God speaks the word, it does not lie dormant inside of your heart. There is power. The Bible says God's word is sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing the heart asunder. God's word, when it is spoken, whether you respond to it uh, on a particular day or it's days down the road or weeks, God's word is still accomplishing something for the plan of God. And ultimately, that's what was going on in Saul's life. And then on that fateful day, he had gotten authority from the religious rulers and he was going to get them. And he took that time, he went on the way to Damascus and he was going to bring them all back. He was breathing out murderous threats. Let me tell you, let me tell you how, how bad it was, how, how, how uh, disconcerting that it was at that moment. They were, it was not, I mean, you know, folks, let me tell you, people can, uh, can badmouth you, but it's not killing you. We say we're under persecution, but we've never had, had an authority come and, and begin uh, saying, if you don't stop serving Jesus and preaching Jesus, you will be arrested. Or at least not in this country. 
I mean, what we would call persecution is simply not as it relates to what Paul was, Saul was about to do and had done. I mean, when's the last time you were at the point of a gun? When's the last time anybody in this church that we lost a member because they were martyred for the gospel of Jesus Christ? And so that's my point. But they were under the fire of it. They were under the gun uh, with much less words. They, they were under fire because of their stand for Jesus Christ. They were being persecuted. They, and it goes on throughout the word and even in the early church. And, I, and just uh, for the gospel's sake, people stand up even in today's uh, economy. And I'm not talking financially, but, but our worldview today, people around the world are still being killed for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was breathing out. Here is literally breathing in. He's literally breathing. What does it mean? It is, it is a he was breathing in and breathing out persecution. It's a Greek participle indicating it had become characteristic and continuous. He was a madman. It was not just some ruler that was upset with a few Christians. It was all he could think about. He was stubbornly refusing to allow the message to penetrate his heart. But let me tell you, God can still work with a stubborn heart. It's a word that tells us breathing in, breathing out, that it was ongoing. In other words, Saul created an atmosphere around him of threats and, and murder so that he was constantly breathing in. It consumed his every thought. It consumed him when he was going to bed and when he got up in the morning. It's all he thought about. And as oxygen enables an athlete to keep going, that murderous atmosphere kept Saul going. He put many in prison and voted to put them to death. Only the spilling of more blood would satisfy his obsessive hatred of Christians. Let me tell you, Saul hated Christians. Saul hated the church. Have you ever come across anybody that had such a vehemence, a vehemence I mean, of just ugliness of the church do at times 10 and 20 and 400,000 and more. That's the type of mentality Saul had. He wanted to liquidate every vestige of Christianity. So he and his posse was on the way to Damascus. Can I tell you, God's grace can reach anybody. I gotta say it again because y'all don't sound too excited about that. I said, God's grace can reach anybody. God's grace can touch anybody. I don't care how bad they are. God's grace. God, God's not talking about judgment here. God, God's talking about grace. Yes, I understand that, that one day the judgment of God is coming to this earth, but God said, I'm not willing that any should perish. God's grace. And we're not in the judgment business, we're in the grace business. We've been called to call people out. We don't convict anybody. We love everybody. That doesn't mean I don't speak the truth of the word and declare it just as it is into a world that wants to change it and to make it better palatable for today. But I can tell you, God does not change his word for anybody. Neither did he change it for Saul. But he, and, and because of that, he was the same God to all the others, the 3,000 on the day of Pentecost that got saved. And then later, 5,000 that came. So they're roughly a 10,000-plus church and, or more. And now they were around that, that Eastern society and uh, uh, over 100 miles away from the, uh, 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 the, the point of Jerusalem where it all began. And Saul, in his demonic activity, was on his way ready to kill. They were probably talking about how many we're going to get today, boys. How many we're going to bring in today and bring back? We're going to get rid of this. Who do they think they are? He's a dead. They're serving a dead man anyway. So he thought. Can I tell you, number one, there's power in the grace of God. And that would be my first point. I want to remind you what grace is. I want to remind you that once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, Paul said in verse 2, 
You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. And he is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. And all of us used to live that way. Every one of us used to live that way. Come on, we're going we're gonna to talk about Paul in a negative way, but every one of us were Paul, Saul's. We didn't give God the time of day. We wanted to do our own thing. Who do we think we are to judge? Well, you look at Saul there. Look what he did. I'm glad I'm not Saul. Well, everybody else prays that. Even the publican that was praying and the the sinner that prayed and the, the, the Pharisee, I'm glad I'm not like this man. How would you feel if somebody prayed right beside you and said, I'm glad I'm not like him, Jesus? Think about it is we're all in the same boat together. We've all come out of the, the same uh, 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 arena of sin because uh, all have sinned that come short of the glory of God. Stop putting on air. Stop putting on better than who you really are. We're No, we're not sinners any longer, but we were sinners, but we've been saved by grace. <laughs> God brought us out. Bible even declares it this way. He brought me out of the deep miry clay. And set my feet on a rock. Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. You're not a sinner any longer. If you're a child of God, you're a grace daughter or son of God. Graced daughter or son of God. <laughs> For by grace are you saved. But God is rich in mercy. God is rich in mercy. And he loved us so much, verse 4 says. Verse 5 of Ephesians 2 says that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Verse 6 says, Ephesians 2, for he raised us up from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace. God can say, look at my kids there. Wow. Come on, just, just, just look at my kids right there. <laughs> See, we, we say, God, we're nothing. We, we, look what I've done. Look what I did last week. God, how can I be recipients of your grace? But God says, look at my kids. His richness, okay, come on, come on now. Here's what God is saying. When he sees you, he sees the deposit of his grace. Oh, I don't think you got that. Let me, let me, let me go over here. So when he sees you, Leon, he doesn't see your past, your present. He sees himself deposited inside of you. You are rich. Y'all won't be here a while. Y'all just, y'all just, okay. See, you and I know this. Do you know you are a supernatural, spiritual gazillionaire? Okay, don't, don't get too excited. And uh, um, so, so, uh, isn't that pretty cool? You retired, right? And you loving it. You retired. I just want y'all to know Danny's a rich man. If you need anything, call him up. Now, let me explain that. He retired as a gazillionaire with the grace of God. He saved you, man. I wish I could tell each of you that face to face, but I'm telling you now, every one of you, you are a spiritual gazillionaire. You have the richest of grace. And he looks at you and he says, look at my kids. Oh, come on. Look at my kids. The transforming power of God's grace. Look at my kids, what they are today. Understand, for by grace are you saved. For we, see, Ephesians 2, 9, 2, 8 says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. You get that? You can put all your money in the bank, but it means nothing unless you have the grace of God. Because money's going to go. 
buddy. It's going to go. And when Jesus comes, you, I mean, do you want to be doing like this? Hang on, Jesus. Let me bring it with me. Tell somebody you can't take it with you. So your, your incredible usefulness to God is not necessarily because you got all the riches. Now, God will use a rich man. God will use a poor man. God will use, God will use whatever you got if you'll give it to him. But understand this morning, your usefulness to God is not because of what you've done. Your usefulness of God is based on what he has done. We have done nothing. So God says, no, none of us can boast about it because if it was us, we'd try to sell it. Hey! We both said, look what I've done. You've done nothing. I've done nothing to merit the grace of God. I can't do anything. Stop getting your pride lifted up and get your, get your pride off your shoulders. It's nothing that you have done. It's nothing this church has done. It's nothing you'll ever be able to do. It's the grace of God. It's the grace of God. Verse 10 said, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. What he did in Saul, who became Paul, is what he's doing in us and others. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. This is going to get a little bit tough, so hang on. Have you ever given up on someone who needed to come to Christ because you or I estimated there's no way? Maybe you love this person, but he or she is so threatening and so angry and so hostile to the faith and to anyone who would mention Jesus, that is, and that you would want to stay as far away as possible from them. And Saul of Tarsus, he was that kind of a man. Nobody wanted to be around him as far as the way people, the Christian. He was the top gun of Jewish leadership in his day. He had the right family background, he had the right education. He had, he had graduated most likely first in his class, proven his loyalty time and time again to the Jewish faith over and over again. And that was his calling card. I'm Saul. And everybody, ooh, they shuddered because he was Saul. Even to the point of Ananias saying, Lord, do you know what he's doing here? I think that's funny right there. I don't know. I don't care who you are. That's just funny. Telling the Lord what he's doing here. <laughs> and Lord, do you know what Saul's doing here? The Lord could have said, no, tell me about it. <laughs> but he did. <laughs> okay, that didn't really have anything to do with the message. That's just kind of funny. Saul of Tarsus was religious, trained by, even, by, by Gamaliel. You'll see his name. The teacher's teacher. Gamaliel was the teacher's teacher that day. Saul knew the scriptures very well. He was respected, and he was, he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the, which is the Jewish supreme court of that day. And when the new sect of Christ's followers began growing, he dedicated his life to stamping them out. He wasn't going to try to argue them out of existence with his intellect. He used brute force to hunt them down, capture them, bring them to trial, and ultimately have them executed. It worked with Stephen and he knew it would work with others. This was not some play date. This was real demonic destruction. See, the problem was that the followers of the way, as they were known, had skipped town. And Saul was determined to find them. And so he headed north to Damascus with his, with his posse to find a few and bring them back to justice in Jerusalem. And, and in his zeal to destroy the church, he asked the high priest for authorization to go into even the synagogues there and just and drag them out and bring them back to Jerusalem over 100 miles away and be put on trial. But right before he got to Damascus, I love it. Right before he got to his ideal place of his service that he thought was right, Okay, let me put a parenthesis in there and explain something to you. Paul thought he was serving God. Do you really, did you, did you know that? Paul thought he was a good Jew. He was a zealous, zealot. He was, he, he thought he was serving God. 
by stamping out this crazy bunch of people. But on that road, something miraculous took place. All of a sudden, he was about, they could probably see the outskirts of Damascus. And they were talking about what first synagogue they were going to go to. They were talking about what, what McDonald's to go to and eat lunch at. And they were getting ready to go. Oh, come on, let your mind wander right with me right now. They were talking about where they're going to eat. And did, but they're, ah, get ready. We're going to get them, Paul, Saul. Saul was working the crowd around him and they were, had their swords ready to go and these were mean men and they, they knew how to do their job. But however, as they were seeing the horizon of, of Damascus coming up, all of a sudden, this light from heaven blinded him and it stopped him and it put him to the ground. And Jesus said, it's my turn. Not much those words. But verse 3, it says, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground. And the voice said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? The word light in the Bible, it said here a great light, a Flashed. The word light in the Bible is often associated with manifestations of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, what some have called, what they called the, a theophany. It was the manifestation of his glory. The rabbis called it the Shekinah, or if I'm pronouncing that right, Shekinah. It was the glory of the Lord, the very presence of God. How many is hungry for the Shekinah glory of God to fall on this place? Acts 9, 4, he fell to the ground and said, why are you persecuting me, God says. And he said, God, who are you, Lord? And the voice replied, said, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. I am. Oh, we've heard that terminology used by Jesus uh, before. We've heard it when God said to Moses after he inquired and said, God, who do we say? What's your name? I don't even know what your name is. And, and, and God responded, I am that I am. I am God. I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. See, he said, Saul, Saul. Because you understand that when, when Jesus said someone's name twice, it was always with quiet compassion. I don't know about you, but uh, when you were raising up, my mama, when she needed me, or my, and uh, mom, I know you're listening to me, and so I, I know you've done this. When, I, when there was not, it wasn't necessarily a happy moment, mom would say, Charles LaDon Taylor. Oh, don't look at me that way. I know how y'all are too. You got to know, it was the whole name. It was, I mean, it was serious then. She didn't go just Charles. It was, it was serious. But when God calls your name twice, it's an emphasis. I've got something for you. Saul, Saul, why are you doing this? Saul replied, God, who are you, Lord? Because let me, let me explain something. In that culture, how me understand the culture of that day. It's not like our Western culture. In that, in that Eastern culture, a voice from heaven was assumed to be God's own voice, but Saul was confused because he fully believed he was doing God's will. Why in the world would God correct him? Saul thought he was on a righteous mission to eradicate followers of this very person, but now he's quivering on the ground before the blinding glory of Jesus Christ, and he's, he's made aware that he's on the wrong team. Just a thought. How many understand it pays to be on the right team? I could go a lot of places with that, but I'm not. It pays to be on the right team. Who you serving? Bible says you can't serve two masters. You can't be on two teams. You can't be on the world's team, and you can't be on God's team all at the same time. You got to choose which team you're going to be on. You got to choose whom you will serve. But Joshua clearly gave out the mandate when he said, but as for me and my house, he said, choose up whatever team you want. God reminds us when we're on the right team, when, 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 the, when the Lord himself came to, 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 to the, the Israelites when they were about to step into and, and follow God into Jericho. And, and the word says that he saw that being the Lord himself. And Joshua said, who... Uh, 
whose side are you on, us or them? Basically, the Lord said, didn't come to choose up sides. I'm the captain of the Lord's host. You got to find out what team you're on. I want to be on the winning team. I said, I want to be on the winning team. And I am. I'm a child of God. <laughs> it, sometimes it may not look like you're winning, but let, let me let you understand, there's a whole lot more for you than there are against you. We're on the winning team. We're on the right side. It may not feel that way and feel that good all the time, but just bear it because you're going to win. Oh, by, well, by the way, you've already won. Shout with me. I am a winner. I have already won. I will totally win. Mm. Saul thought he was on the right team, but he was on the wrong team. He learned that to persecute the church was persecuting Jesus. And in order to appreciate his emotions at this time, it's, it, you got to remember that he was convinced that Jesus was dead. Who are you? Lord? He, he was convinced he was still in a Judean grave. And since the leader of the sect had been destroyed, all that was now necessary was to destroy the followers and then it would be eradicated. And then the earth would be free of this scourge. But now with a crushing force, Saul learns that Jesus is not dead at all, but he has been raised from the dead, and he's been glorified at the right hand of God in heaven. And it was the sight of this glorified Lord and Savior that changed the entire direction of God. Because when you see Jesus, everything else changes. Mm. I want to invite our team to come back. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Whew. I got to say that again. When you see Jesus, everything changes. When you see Jesus, everything changes. When you see Jesus, your whole life changes, past, present, and future. When you see Jesus, get ready. It's about to change in your life. That's the transforming power of the grace of God. But secondly, once you get grace, there's, there's a power in giving God's grace. That's where Ananias comes in. I won't read all the verses 10 to 19. Ananias was a disciple, a believer. I don't know if he was one that had come all the way from, from Jerusalem, and he was uh, one of the instigators of, of, of uh, reaching there, the people of God, the, the Jews and Gentiles there in Damascus, or he, he was one that was reached. We don't know that. But the Bible says he was a disciple of Jesus Christ. And he said, I want you to get up and go to Straight Street. Ask at the house of Judas for a man named Saul. He's had a vision that a man named Ananias is going to come and lay his hands on me, and he's going to be healed, and he's going to be, he's, he's going to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And then Ananias started his protesting. Folks, there's no confidence in protesting God. He said, Lord, I, I've heard about this guy, and I, I hear what he's here to do, and you want me to go talk to him? See, Ananias in his flesh was probably afraid that he's going to die. And so God says, Ananias, what you don't understand is I chose Saul because I got some powerful things for him to accomplish in this world. But I need a man that'll be used of me to share my grace to him. And so in a very astounding act of courage, Ananias pushed his way through his reasonable fears and he obeyed Jesus. He went to the house where Saul was staying. He placed his hands on Saul. He was a murderer. He had done heinous acts. He had a past. That he couldn't get away from. And he began to pray for him. I don't know what he prayed. I don't know what he started with and how he ended it. But all we know 
after he laid his hands on him. It's like scales, fishy scales, we don't know, fell off of his eyes. And he was totally made whole, filled with the Holy Ghost, saved, sealed, filled, and then baptized in water, I believe. And then he ate. Can I just remind you that when we think someone is beyond hope and outside the possibility of being transformed by Christ's love, we need to be reminding ourselves of what God did in Saul's life who became Paul. Sometimes the person that we give up on is ourselves. We think, how can God love me? Look what I've done. There was a woman that she went to her doctor, a gynecologist, and she got into the office, and when the doctor came came in and he started talking to her, she just busted out crying. And this wise doctor had gone through this before with others, and he knew what was going on. She told him her story and and said, and the doctor said, can't, can't you forgive her yourself? Because 20 years before, she had had an abortion and killed her baby. He said, can you forgive yourself? And she just shook her head. She thought she was too far gone. So he asked her, this doctor said to her, he said, are are you better than Christ? And she thought, what do you mean? And she said, no, not at all. And he smiled. He said, he forgives you. And if he's willing to forgive you, you can forgive yourself. Because it's the only way to be free from your guilt and from your shame. She later, she said, a little some later date, she said, that was the turning point in my life. Because from that moment, I was able to accept the forgiveness of Christ for the wrong I had done. And because of him, I was finally able to forgive myself. Maybe that person that's long gone is maybe you. You feel like I can't forgive myself. Let me tell you, if Jesus has forgiven you, forgiven. Stop letting the devil play reruns in your mind. Stop turning on the rerun channels. Come on now. Stop turning on those channels of old in your mind and let God totally rewrite something inside of you. I am the child of God. Stand with me. It's normal for God's love and power to reach into sin-darkened hearts. But it's also normal for him to ask the Ananiases of the world, people like you and me, to be willing to show love and kindness to anyone who has the light, to let the light of Christ shine on them. Gang members, prostitutes, powerful officials, the rich, the poor, the homeless, the whoever they are, God wants to use us as Ananiases. We've received the grace. Now God wants us to share the grace. See, we label people as if it's the final word on their character. We call them liars, criminals, addicts, abusers, selfish, cruel, shallow, and a hundred other names. And if, and if we're really honest, many of us use those same kind of labels in the privacy of our minds, attacking ourselves. But see, God is willing to change our labels. How many has got a past? No, you don't. That was a setup, wasn't it? (laughs) How many sinned in the past? No, you didn't. Because it's justification of God just as if you never sinned. Old things are passed away and all things have become new. How many messed up in the past? No, you didn't. Now, 
I, I understand that. I, I, I get that. I, I, in our minds, we realize, yeah, oh, pastor, you're being stupid. That It happened. Don't be an idiot, pastor. I get the understanding. But see, when I look through God's eyes, God sees nothing there. And I struggle with it just like everybody else does. But God reminds us, old things are gone. Paul said it this way. Paul, the Saul that was killing Christians, he said later in the book of Philippians, forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth to the things that are ahead, I press toward the mark of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That's where number three comes in. The testimony of God's grace. Will you be one that will testify? And that's where Paul came in. Because once he received the grace, he began to testify. Put it up here, guys. He began to testify about the grace of God. How many has got a word of testimony? How many has got a word of testimony? Look what God has done. Will you share it? There was a, there's got to be a, an understanding that God can save anybody. How many's got some people in your family? How many's got people at work that says, hmm? You say, hmm, there's a lot of crazy people out there. I don't know about that, Pastor. But if God can save you, He can save anybody. I mean, to believe God can save Muslims. I believe it. I believe God can save and change the trajectory of terrorists. Paul was a terrorist. Can I, I'm going to share a story with you. There was an open marketplace in a Muslim area and a man, he had a New Testament in his hands, a Muslim, and he tore it into pieces and he threw the fragments all over the ground. And immediately, immediately his hands became paralyzed. And many people saw it. He had paralyzed hands after he tore that New Testament up. But there was a man, and he went home scared, but there was a Christian brother that followed him. He saw it. And he told the man he would pray for him in the name of Jesus, but that he needed to put his faith in Christ. And so the Muslim, the paralyzed man, agreed to be prayed for. And so the brother, the Christian man, prayed. And the paralyzed man was healed and accepted Jesus Christ right there. And when he was being discipled, he asked to be baptized and said, here, this is so awesome. He said, I tore God's word up in public and I don't want to be baptized in secret. They prepared in a Muslim area, the marketplace in a Muslim nation, they prepared a tank on the street, filled it with water, and baptized right there. I'm telling you, God can do anything. Will you be a testimony of grace? And this is my last one. Put it up there, guys, number four. Say with me, speak words of grace and encouragement. When they were... Believers kind of had a tough time receiving Saul, who was now Paul. But then you read on in chapter 9, it says they took him to Barnabas. Barnabas' name means son of encouragement. Barnabas was a man of encouragement. And he said, wait, 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 guys. I want to remind you, look what God has done through Paul's life. He is declaring the word of God. Yeah, he had a past, but he don't have a past. He murdered. No, no, he didn't murder. No, because God saved him. He's not, it didn't happen. God, God changed everything. He is now a brother in the Lord. And he began to change the nations around him. What can your words do? God is looking for Ananias and Barnabases that will share the love and gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, I just got to ask you a question. Do I give grace or do I heap shame? When you're talking to people, are you, are you giving grace or are you giving shame? 
I want to give grace. How about you? Because I got grace. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your love. The grace of God that has beyond my ability to understand it. Five years old in Jay, Florida, God, I gave my heart to you. I will never forget it. God, I needed and have needed and will continue to need a whole lot of grace. Over these years, I've come back to you many, many times. But every time, you've been there to show me grace. I want you to look this way. There's not a one in this room that's done anything bad enough to stop the grace of God. God loves you. Yes, my sin, it comes against the nature of God. But God went beyond what was normal. And he sent his son Jesus Christ to die for me. Rose again. Exalted to the right hand of God. And let me tell you, Jesus is coming soon. I don't want to just wait till then to experience the presence of God because as a grace-filled child of God, I experience His presence right now. Anybody here glad of God's grace? Anybody here still needs grace? Amen.